little different. <laughs> Man, this is gonna be like super duper interesting. Like, you know, what's life without breakdowns? Wait, how far does this cut off my head? Uh, you're about three inches now, so you're good. Okay, so if I go like this, I'm good? No, you're fine, you're fine, I won't move anything. What's up everybody? I'm Mark Monroe and welcome to something a little bit new. Now in previous, you know, seasons I've done, you know, just your simple come up. I've done the breakdown. Check out that salmon. More recipes on the way. And on top of that, we've done, you know, stuff like Dr. Market and all those other great things. And we've kind of like gotten into this process where I feel like everybody's starting to get into a groove. But I would be remiss if I didn't talk about a few things. And this season, one of the shows that I'm gonna be introducing to everybody is called Future Proof. Now the whole premise behind Future Proof is just the concept of being able to make sure that you guys, viewers at home, or if you're sitting on a subway watching this video, kudos to you that each and every single one of you at home are able to actually be able to start to anticipate things that are gonna be coming from the market, uh, whether on the private side, as well as on the public side. So one of the things that I always like preface is, I always tell people that you can always look to private markets to help to dictate future public markets. I'm Mark Monroe, again, or wait, you guys know who I am. I mean, I think you guys know who I am by now, right? All right, so just cue the intro for Future Proof. So can private markets dictate publicly traded markets? Short answer, yes. Long answer, there's a lot of gray area to fill into that. So let's go ahead and just do a simple, you know, deep dive. Before we get into that, let's look at like how startups ultimately formulize. When you have a startup, there's some type of great idea or some type of mag magnanimous idea that solves some significant problem. And then from there, um, you go through this process of working to validate in the marketplace after you built your MVP, AKA minimal viable product, um, and within there, it's like as you go through that process and as the market starts to accept it, you go through periods of investment, so which means through seeds, series A to probably series D or E or F. And pretty much all throughout that process, you know, you're probably going to be taking on tons of different investment all the way up till you go through that process at series E or F and you finally decide maybe it's time for us to go publicly traded if you haven't been acquired by that point in time. So that's pretty much like the, the crash course of like kind of like the cycle of how startups go through. And each and every single one of those periods of time, they represent arenas of growth. So when you go from seed round to say, for example, series A round, you validated your MVP within the market in the marketplace. So essentially what that means, hey, we've launched a product. People love the product or service idea. And essentially we're starting to get enough market share. We're starting to gather or garner attention from investors. So then now you prepare yourself for the series A round, which we normally call the institutional round because now you're starting to get more sophisticated investors. Seed round is a lot of times a mixture of some sophisticated investors, but also uh, friends and family can also be in there. But when you reach your series A round, that's kind of like where you're officially official. And then after that, it's like you're probably going through multiple different rounds. So. And all those periods of time, you're going from ideation to growth and then ultimately to scale. And what's happening within the marketplace? As the marketplace starts to accept what it is that you've launched and what is it that you've placed into the market, then you also start to see that the market also starts to have those small shifts. Like journey back, just think about what it took for Uber as a startup company when they first got started or DoorDash when they first got started. Or let's even go even further and look at like companies like Tesla when they were a startup. Or let's even say, for example, Spotify when they were a startup. Each and every single one of them had their own validations uh, within the marketplace. But then it asks that other question. Was the market actually ready 
for them to enter? Or did they ultimately create the market? Now, one of the things that I will forever say to people is that when you deal with markets, especially within private markets or startups, a lot of times they come in where you start to see where there's some economic gaps. So where you start to see that those market opportunities, you see those as gaps within the marketplace. For example, think about how the gig economy got started. Like if we think about the gig economy and where it started, where its genesis was, it started back at around the same time that we started to see that the financial crisis took place. Yeah, we all remember that phase. You know, a lot of people only remember the idea of the stock market crashing. But if you looked at what was happening on the private side market, AKA the startup world, everything was booming. There was a lot of great ideas that were coming forth. There was a lot of innovation that was being spurned. And the same thing is gonna take place during this time period where we had the world pretty much come to a standstill. So you start to see that some startups get better. And then ultimately it's like they start to, they start to validate that. And the reason why that that's a very crucial point is because of the fact that they ultimately dictated. Think about all the fintech startups that were ultimately created around the same time that you had a Square. And then think about all the companies that came after Square had started. A lot of times we only look at Square as like the end all be all or many times the, the poster child for fintech companies, which rightfully so, it deserves a part of that. But think about some of the other startups. You also have Plaid. You also have also companies like Stripe, which are still private companies. What about them? They also dictate what we see that's taking place within publicly traded markets. How do we know this? Here are some key things that you can look at of how we can kind of like spot those arenas. Look at the merger and acquisition activity. Look at the offers that these companies get. Like once upon a time where we started to see that companies get acquisition offers and then ultimately those companies turn them down, you know that they're probably going to be a publicly traded company. Like let's go back and think about like Slack when it got acquisition offers from Microsoft and Salesforce. They turned those companies down and then later came to the publicly traded markets. And then now look at them today. So yes, all in all. Sorry, could you say that again? Sorry. Oh my God, this, Siri needed to mind her business. So when we look at startups like FinTech companies that came forth, like again, your Squares, your Stripes, your Plaid, and many others, look at the activity in which that is sperm. You look at the amount of investment activity, which a lot of folks pay attention to. We look at the merger and acquisition activity that also took place, but it's much more deeper than that. Think about also the economic impacts that they also have. So for example, this year Square, AKA through its Cash App, will probably have folks using Cash App to also be able to help you with your, or to actually have some folks file their taxes. Now, whether or not you should do that or not, that's a whole different situation. That's to your discretion. But it just goes to show you the power in which that they've been able to attract so much data on users and also learning from them, from their behavior, that they've now created more markets for them to literally step in and take more from the other markets. So when we look at startups that are going through the process of literally going through that maturation process, it, it's very interesting, and especially coming from a venture capital standpoint, because you start to see how much the markets really start to adapt. Like think about when Uber started to adapt its market share. Think about Airbnb. Think about the disruption in which that they cause. Like think about like how like traditional hotels literally started to struggle against a platform like an Airbnb. I mean, think about like once upon a time, like just think about the lineage of it also. And that where is, that's really where it becomes very interesting because we had things like Craigslist and then you went from Craigslist to probably couchsurfing.com and then from couchsurfing.com you went to an Airbnb. But think about before then, what spurred that? Well, maybe it was because of the fact that because of the fact that we started seeing that hotel prices were so expensive and also that the same token, you kind of like didn't really get to get the full landscape experience of feeling like a quote unquote local in a typical geographical location. It produced a huge opportunity for a company like an Airbnb. 
I mean, I'm just saying, just sit back and just imagine it. Like, you know, just think about it. You're on the precipice. And the question is, how does this impact your portfolio today? Like that's the million dollar question, right? Or the multi-billion dollar question. Can we actually say that companies that we look at today, the trends that we see within startup investing or the startup world today, can we see that they will have a massive impact on what publicly traded markets will be? Yes, they will. The reason why they will is because you can kind of look at things on a generational perspective. If you look at the average age of most of your startup founders, they're, pre they're between the ages of their early 20s and mid 30s. Think about the generational, think about the generational piece behind that. Some of the most innovative companies that we're gonna see, given that we are here in 2022 at the time of recording this video, that means that essentially that you're gonna start seeing a lot more Gen Z founders start to hit the marketplace. And as they hit the marketplace, then you're going to start to see shifts within the landscapes within the publicly traded markets. We're already starting to see that, right? Because millennials are now investors. Baby boomers are ultimately probably gonna start moving more towards fixed income. Your Gen Xers are gonna more so be very much so focused on their 401ks as, as it pertains to them getting to the last leg or the last mile, uh, which is over the next you know, 20 years, so to speak. And then essentially from there, um, then you're gonna see that it just consistently shifts. So then you start to see the companies that really start to take shape and have fashion, the ones that matter generationally to each and every single generation. So if we think about it, here's some homework for you. I want you to look at the companies, like for each generation, what were the most successful startups during the baby boomer generation, during the Gen X generation, millennial generation, and what are some of the startups that we're seeing right now that are part of the Gen Z population? You'll start to notice, you'll see a trend because those same companies that were startups around the time or, or even public, and here's another part. Look at the publicly traded companies also that were popular during their time frame. You'll tend to find that essentially that those companies, well, maybe I said too much. But the reason why I say focus on the startups, all in all, if you didn't, if you didn't catch anything else from what I said in this video, the reason why I say that startups dictate publicly traded markets is because one day they'll be in the publicly traded markets and they'll carry enough market share and AKA enough mind share where essentially we're moving into this place where it's a winner take all environment. And as it gets into a winner take all environment, you'll start to see that essentially that those things carry on because they have social equity. And when we mean by social equity, when you have startups that are a part of the lifeblood of a generation, they carry through alongside all the way till its end. In conclusion, here's what you should look at when we think about can startups dictate the publicly traded markets. One, um, what does the deal flow look like? How many companies that are coming out? You can kind of get an idea of what the trend is based upon how many companies are like those companies or within a specific sector, AKA whether, whether is it FinTech, is it artificial intelligence, is it robot, robotics, you know, deep learning. Um, you'll start to see a multitude of different startups that step into the space. The next thing to do is look at the investments that come through. A source that you can use that can ultimately tell you the deal flow of many of these startups is go check out crunchbase.com. It's a wonderful resource in which that you can use, so that way you can actually see how much one has a company raised, who's been involved into the rounds and everything else, and it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good way for perspective. Another thing that you can look at is a place called Angel.co, and Angel.co literally is kind of like the library or the encyclopedia for startups, where it shows you all the startups out there that exist, because therein you'll start being able to see the trends. And then the thing is, look at the companies, AKA startups, that are, look at where they are, like where the series of the rounds that they've just recently raised will tell you a lot about how soon are they close to coming towards a publicly traded market near you. So again, look at the activity, look at the investment, who's involved, and then ultimately where they are in the cycle of things. You do that, 
you can kind of get an early, early age jump on what's coming next down the pipeline. If you like the video, go ahead and hit the like button. And if you want to be in the know for when a new one drops, go ahead and hit that bell. And if you haven't subscribed yet, subscribe. Until next time, I'm Mark Monroe. This is Future Proof. See you in the next one.